Welcome back to the podcast. I am currently in Italy. Hopefully there is not too much background noise. There is a bit of construction and cars and traffic going back in the background. I'm here for the start of Tour de France and a science and cycling nutrition conference. I was asked to come and be a guest speaker for a Q&A panel the Hexus Elite Nutrition Cycling Conference, which was really fun. And I wanted to share some of the thoughts and the questions and comments and conversations that I have been having today with my colleagues and with other professionals working in the cycling nutrition field, because there is so much that has changed in the last five, six years that I've been working in pro cycling and amateur cycling, particularly focusing as a sports dietitian. And that's what I got asked to sort of share key things that I've seen change in terms of practice and then be able to answer sort of questions from the community. And I think for me overall, the the number one thing that I've seen change in pro cycling is is definitely nutrition and fueling. You've heard me talk before about how I think, obviously I'm biased, but I think that nutrition is probably the biggest performance enhancer that athletes, cyclists, endurance athletes can be utilizing to improve their performance, their recovery, their body composition, their health. And a lot of this really does come down to timing, which if you've listened to any of the previous podcast episodes or watched any of my other videos, you'll hopefully see come through time and time again. The big thing that I've seen change in terms of practice is how and what people are feeling. So back in 2018, 2019, when I was full-time working with a pro cycling team, we were aiming for 60 to 80 grams of carbs an hour during fueling, and we thought that was good going. Where now in 2024, a lot of the times we are aiming for 90, 100, 120, sometimes even a little bit higher grams of carbohydrate per hour in fueling and what I see time and time again with all my athletes male and female when I help them and support them to be fueling more appropriately in training before during and after that's where we add additional food in I see them getting leaner I see them getting stronger I see them performing above and beyond what they should be performing based on their body physique um, compared to other athletes and I certainly think this has had a big part into why athletes are racing so much faster and recovering so much faster is the way they're eating has completely changed and there's a lot of examples that I've seen with athletes do that sometimes they're gaining weight and getting stronger Um, others it might be losing weight it really comes down to the individual as to what that person needs but that doesn't mean that everybody needs to have 120 grams of carbs per hour and it certainly doesn't mean that's what we're fueling all the time during a race, during in training, it really is about being specific to the purpose. And that was one of one of the talks actually was, do we need to be fueling 120 grams an hour for all athletes? And some, it was really cool to look through some of the old studies, old research um, papers that have been done 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago, which show very clearly how and why carbohydrates are so important for speed and performance we need fats obviously for fuel and for longevity and endurance but it's a very slow sluggish fuel so if you're looking to perform at speed and you're relying on fat as fuel then you're cutting off 20 plus percent of your top capacity which actually comes down to comes back to one of the first questions that we got asked we were asked questions about whether we have athletes that are using ketogenic diets or intermittent fasting the thing i find with intermittent fasting it works really well for sedentary people people who have office jobs who aren't doing any sport or aren't very active maybe only doing a bit of weights a little bit of gym but for endurance cycling triathlon swimming running i find when people are skipping meals the the cost is not worth the benefit. There is there isn't much of the benefit in terms of their performance and their health. It usually actually works against them um, in terms of increasing their appetite, their hunger cues, creating a lot of stress internally, leading them more to likely having reds, relative energy deficiency in sport or low energy availability, which has a whole host of um, health and performance um, negative effects that are associated with that. So. I've certainly seen and clients who have been using or wanting to use a ketogenic diet for their performance. I find it's most beneficial for someone that is doing multi-day, like 24-hour plus, 48-hour, three-day, non-stop, like ultra-endurance cycling or running events. So the pace is slow. And 
again, when if you put this into the test, like what happens when you have no carbohydrate in your body, you've bonked, you've hunger flattered, that, that speed, that's your max capacity to use fat as fuel. Testing it out, knowing for yourself, like what is your max capacity? You can do it. And I see people that can and do get leaner using ketogenic diets, but it usually comes at the cost of their performance and sometimes their health as well. So I don't generally recommend it. Um, I would use it specifically for specific circumstances. If someone is really adamant that they want to use intermittent fasting, when I'm working with them one-on-one as a client, we would be going through what days would be appropriate. So it might be a day in the office where they're doing no exercise. That may be an appropriate day to do a fasting day or a low-carb day. Whereas if they're doing a lot of training, there will be days when we actually need to add carbs in to fuel that effort, to fuel their recovery. It's not a case of I would never use it, but I'd be very strategic. And if someone's looking to perform at their peak, then you're just, it's like adding weights to yourself and trying to drag an anchor while you're running or swimming or or cycling and and why like why is this so hard why am I so slow it's like well you don't have the fuel there that was the first question that came up a conversation I had with some colleagues was about a Zempic now I did a video for my in the fuel team for my private members membership probably about six months ago about a Zempic and I'll probably do I might look at doing another video here on YouTube or a podcast to explain a little bit more about my thoughts and and, and the research behind sort of why but I had a flippant comment uh, earlier this year from someone that's like oh the cyclists are on a Zempic and that's how they're all losing weight and I'd gone and done a lot of research and reading into it and actually for me I found it very concerning what I was finding with people viewing a Zempic as this like quick fix weight loss that's just going to drop off me when reality is usually people are using something like a Zempic for about 18 months and maybe they lose somewhere between 8 to 10 12 kilos over that 18 month period but the I think the the thing for me that was quite concerning was that usually 50 to 60 percent of the weight lost is muscle and a lot of times people have lost that weight and they regain it quite quickly in the 6-12 months afterwards but they don't regain the muscle. And the amount of muscle people are losing in a six, 12 month period of using something like a Zempic, that could be one or two decades worth of muscle loss that you might see through general aging. Like as we get older, if we're not using it, we lose it, which is why it's important to be eating well and also stimulating our muscles to maintain and protect our muscle mass as we get older. That's certainly something I'm incorporating more strength training into my weekly schedule at the moment because I'm thinking ahead in 20, 30 years, I want to be made as strong and have as much muscle mass as possible and be able to be as independent as possible as I get older. I'm very concerned about this generation or people that are using a Zempic as a quick fix, thinking like, yeah, the weight's just going to drop off. For me, body composition is always more important to be looking at than weight. Because yes, I've, most of my clients do come to see me for weight loss, but sometimes they need to gain weight. But when we're looking at losing, gaining weight, it's like active weight. Like ideally we want to be preserving bone mass. We want to be building or preserving muscle mass and losing fat mass if that's what the goal is to be losing weight. Whenever we lose weight, especially if we lose it really quickly, we lose muscle especially if we're not having being active enough, we're not doing enough strength, we don't have enough protein in our diet. And so the diet quality as well as the lifestyle and the training is important. I have worked with clients who are using a Zempic. They are not professional clients, they're amateur clients. The thing that I've seen with every client that was a cyclist that's taken a Zempic to help them lose weight or to start a weight loss process is that they've almost had to stop cycling. They've had to really cut back on their cycling capacity. Their ability, their effort capacity is very, very low because they're only able to eat small amounts of food at one time before feeling nauseous. It does have a big impact on food types. doesn't stop people from eating poorly. So I do still see people who might be using something like Zempic as a quick fix, still living, eating poor quality diets. That will then just maintain and return once they they stop taking the drug and stop taking the injections. Whenever we're looking at any sort of weight loss intervention, we want to be having something that is changing behavior and changing long-term. If I'm looking at someone helping them lose weight, I want them to be able to lose that and maintain it more or less over the next 6, 12, 18 plus months and be able to carry it on for life. We don't want them to be losing like 5, 10 kilos and then bouncing back 
and regaining, like any of those yo-yo diets has a, a big impact on us metabolically, but also it's more likely that the weight we're regaining is fat mass. Losing muscle mass can be losing bone mass. I've seen people lose bone mass within a 12 month period from doing extreme dieting. And for me, as a dietitian, I'm always concerned, yes, about performance. I want to help people get the best performance that they can get on the bike, in their everyday life. But I'm also very conscious of health. And so all the recommendations that I make for people usually have multiple impacts. It might be their health for their bone health. It might be their mental health, their physical health, whatever it is. It's the long-term impact and the long-term health I'm also really concerned about. So I think I'll do a separate video, go into more detail about um, the science behind Azempic and the the research. And But like I can tell you hands down that anyone that is taking Azempic is not racing. They're not performing. They're back down to maybe baseline winter training at a very low intensity. Nothing of high intensity can be tolerated because you can't consume enough fuel without vomiting or feeling sick in order to tolerate that um, that high intensity. The muscle then leads me on to the next question that we had, which was a, about protein, particularly in terms of vegan diets. There was a couple of questions about what we see in terms of protein. Is it possible to get enough protein? Are people having too much protein? With protein, like it's the it nutrient of the moment. Protein is very important for feeling fuller for longer. It's important for muscle health. It's important for muscle repair. Patterns that I'll see is that sometimes people are getting enough protein overall, but then the distribution is out of alignment. So it's all coming at dinner. So we want to spread that out. So you're getting more at breakfast, more at lunch, more at, more at dinner and after training to help with muscle repair, muscle rebuilding, recovery. Sometimes it's more a case of the timing. The only case where like I'm usually recommending getting people to be eating my athletes, my clients, these are healthy individuals. If someone was sick and they had a kidney issue or they had underlying medical issues, this is again where blanket statements, it's always dependent on the person. Typically I'm using around two two to three grams per kilogram of protein per day. Anytime we need to eat more, all of the nutrients that we're eating are going up. So with like my pro athletes, they might be eating five, six, 7,000 calories a day. A lot of that will be coming into their training to support their training. But if you're eating three, 4,000 calories a day, then you need to consume a lot of food. More of that will come from protein, more will come from fats, more will come from carbs than a normal everyday diet. But with protein sources, I find it's definitely possible with a vegan diet to get enough protein in. It just requires more effort and more intention. I've always said I think everyone should be on a plant-based diet. Whether you choose to add meat and animal products is up to your discretion and your preferences. Personally, I do eat meat. I do eat animal products. I have a lot of clients that don't, and I support them with that. What I do find, though, is that the more restrictive someone's diet is, the more vegan they go, the more we have to rely and we often need to use plant protein powders and supplements in order to meet their nutritional requirements. So I do have vegan athletes that are taking protein powders two, three times a day in order to get enough to help with the bioavailability. And they will be doing a lot more, three, four times as much meal prep versus someone that might eat a mixed diet. So it's always about quality and quantity. Do you have the time? Do you have the capacity? And rather than like with meat or fish or chicken, you can just use one protein source. With a plant-based diet, we need to use four or five different sources within the same meal. So rather than just having that chicken on a salad, it might be you have some tofu plus some chickpeas plus some hummus plus some hemp seeds plus what else we might add into there, a couple of nuts and seeds as well to sort of help bump it up. And all those things together will be helping you get to like 20, 30 grams of protein in that meal. But relying on one food alone, it's very difficult unless you're only eating tofu. And in that situation, there'll be certain amino acids that you'll be missing out in that meal in your diet. So it is about balance, but it's looking at what's the spread, what's the type, what's the distribution, what effort and capacity have you got in order to ensure that the quality of that is important. And I think that goes for any dietary restriction. I have a lot of clients that are celiac or that need to be on gluten-free diets for celiac disease or for an intolerance. In that situation, we have to be really intentional with other foods that we're incorporating because with gluten-free foods, for example, they tend to be lower in fiber and fiber is important for fullness. And so we'll be having to be more intentional about what choices we add as a replacement for a normal wheat bread that have enough fiber to keep 
them feeling full, keep them regular and help, help with their gut and their bowel health. It's not a case of one diet is better than others. Everyone has different situations, different preferences coming into this, but looking at where we can optimize the quality and this is where for me, I like to really clearly distinguish. We have our everyday nutrition, we have our training nutrition, and we have our race nutrition. They're different entities. They're related. Everyday nutrition is our baseline. It's the quality. It's where we're looking, getting that fiber, the, the nutrients, the, all the different plants, 30 different trying to get as many as we can in the course of the week for different vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, health recovery. That's our baseline. And then we add onto that with our training. And it really does come down to the training because someone might be doing five hours a week, another person 10, another 20, 30 hours a week. And as a result, the more training you do, the more food you need. But rather than reactively eating, when we start intentionally adding food into the before, during and after training, that's how you stay lean, it's how you stay strong, it's how you recover and you perform your best in whatever environment you're at. Using those training sessions then to test out your race nutrition, rather than getting to race and wing it and hoping for the best, you know you're confident this ingredient works, this product works for me, I can have this combination, I can have this number of gels, whatever it is, you've tested out, you're confident and you're really clear that that is going to work for you and sustainable and help you perform your best. These are just a couple of the questions that I had in our Q&A. If you do have any questions, please make sure that you submit them into, I have an Ask a Sports Dietitian segment that I do regularly, and I will be doing some more videos like this, answering your questions in the future. So please drop them in the comments and let me know what you would like me to answer for you next. That's all for today. Like, subscribe, fuel your ride, and I will see you soon.